Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Those that are be watching on YouTube, I want to encourage you to take notes or listen to the YouTube twice because this is going to be significant transitional teaching. How many have ever heard of that expression in the natural realm where they're talking about going back to the gold standard? Right? Going back to the gold standard. It makes sense, doesn't it? Well, guess what? In the kingdom of God, I think we all need to go back to the gold standard. Yes. And receiving the gold of the divine nature. You know, all through scripture, wherever gold appears, it's, it's representing the presence or actually not the presence, the nature of God. His essence, his being. So we're going to go for the gold today. And it's really, uh, you know, all these precious promises were given to you so that you might be a partaker of the divine nature of the gold. And uh, we've often said that as a ministry, we're gold miners. And Jesus was a gold miner in a sense, because he, what did he do? He took apostles, he saw the dirt. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you be a gold miner, you got to deal with the dirt, but you got to know how to deal with it, right? Uh, he dealt with the dirt, but he, he literally pulled the gold out of individuals. And uh, in the days ahead, I really feel like uh, um, God's going to have, get, 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 I think some young people need mentored from the beginning because uh, when God took me to the school of the spirit as a baby Christian, here 48 years later, 48 years later, the most impact I had was that school of the spirit by the Holy Spirit. Regardless of everything that's been learned since then, regardless of all the different Bible schools, all the different streams of, of teaching, nevertheless, it was those first couple years of God training me by His Spirit that have evolved into a ministry that helps equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And God called us to be uh, disciplers. And when we traveled, that was our one disappointment. We saw uh, some quality gifting out there in various forms, evangelistic and, and teaching gifts and, and uh, prophetic gift. But at the same time, when it came down to living the Christian life, we saw only the very early stages. Some of the simple character development. Well, we're going to deal with the currency of character. All right. <laughs> uh, so get, get your wallets out and check. See if you have currency in your wallet, all right? See if that character is in you, all right? So I want to start off by giving a, a, a few examples of uh, the types of believers uh, because, uh, you know, believers, the, the spiritual person, that type of believer is what we're, we, we're longing for as believers. Otherwise, you're just in the religion. Um, and... How do you know if you're a spiritual believer? How do you know if you're a spiritual believer? You can indicate by the level of peace in your personal life. When the peace of God rules, Jesus is ruling, that's also a definition of simple lordship. Not just Jesus, my Savior, I, I pray the prayer, ask Jesus to come in. Lordship means he's ruling. To the degree that you have peace in your life, I'm talking supernatural peace. The gold is the divine nature. And you do not have the divine nature without peace. Peace is himself. He himself is our peace. That is the divine nature. That's God. And uh, <clears throat> the supernatural peace of God is an indication of to what degree the gold is, is come to the surface. A lot of times it's hidden by a lot of dross. And it takes, uh, it takes dealings to get to the root of it. That's the spiritual Christian. That's a, that's a good type of believer, someone who's walking in the supernatural peace of God. And by the way, peace is not passive. Peace is militant. It crushes the enemy beneath your feet. 
We've got to shake free of this concept that if I have peace, I'm doing nothing. No, yeah. if you have peace, you're, Jesus is ruling. Amen. That's significant. Now, the second kind is what they call, and some people say there's no such thing, but a carnal Christian is one who may have said the prayer and asked Jesus to come into their heart, but they're pretty much self-focused, learning to, and these are good to write down, to double-check your own heart. They are learning and dealing, they're trying to cope with life. Cope is the primary word. They're trying to cope with life. Unsaved people are trying to cope with life. So what makes you special because you said a board again prayer and you're still coping? You're no different than the world. The second is instead of allowing God that intimate relationship and letting God search your heart, you're self-searched. Self-search means self-analysis, means I want to control my life, so I look within, I'm my own value system. Uh, that might be good moral values, but nonetheless, I'm playing God in my own life. I'm a carnal Christian. And in reality, I'm trying to not just control life, I'm trying to escape life. To escape life, you have to find substitutes, because there's no such thing as a void. If there's a God void, a God-shaped void in your life, trust me, you found substitutes. And they can be legitimate substitutes, like education. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not sinful, is it? Work. You can be a workaholic. Nothing sinful about going to work. As a matter of fact, I hope some of you do. <laughs> and it's that emphasis to escape from life and find a substitute. Jeremiah talked about that. He said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, the source, the divine nature, the gold, and they've hewn for themselves substitutes, cisterns, that really don't hold any living water. And Jennifer just taught on Tuesday, I love it when Jennifer teaches the deep deep supernatural scientific stuff about the two pleasure centers in the brain. I'll get this all messed up, but don't worry about it. She'll explain it later. Because uh, she'll go like this to me while I'm talking. You, know, you got it all wrong. But the two pleasure centers in the brain, one never satisfies. It's like addicts. It never satisfies, but the craving increases. You need more. You need more. You need more, but it doesn't satisfy. Then there's the pleasure center in the brain that actually is satisfied, and it comes out of relationship, or the chemical would be oxytocin even in your physical body. Oxytocin flows when a mother holds her baby for the first time. There's actually a chemical reaction on the inside. We're bonding. It's bonding. Well, God intended you to bond with him first, not, not be a carnal Christian. Um, God's saying, return to the gold standard if that's your case. And not only that, but if you come to Kingdom Life Church, Dennis will make private meetings to see to you that we get through the dirt and get the gold. We are gold miners in this place. That's disciples. That was the missing ingredient we saw when we traveled church to church. We saw exhorters. Um, the the not-so-nice name was cheerleaders. <laughs> but uh, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but exhorters, that's what they do. They're, come on, you can do it, you can do it. But what we want to do is disciple you to tell you how to do it. Because that can be very frustrating. Well, just do it. Well, I don't know how to prophesy. Well, just do it. No, they have courses on these things to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Well, it's the same with character. And quite frankly, character is more important than gifting. Did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy? Did I not? Depart from me, I knew you not. That was talking about the intimacy. You don't have any gold. You've got a lot of dead works. Now, they want to cope with life, control life, escape life, but bottom line, they're self-ruled. They are not God-ruled. I don't care if they did say a sinner's prayer. They are self-ruled. And 
time to, for you to buy something from God that costs. And that's the currency of character development. You need to return to the gold standard, the divine nature. Without the divine nature, your Christianity is nothing but religion or dead works. Um, now, there's also a, a third type of, of Christian. Jennifer would call him, uh, with her training, codependent. <laughs> but it's really needy people. Now, I'm all for needy people. Send me all the needy people you can, but I'm going to show them how to be equipped to meet that need righteously. See, most people push needy people away. Why? Because they're clingy, right? You go, yeah. But the only, that only means you don't have the discipleship tools that are necessary to teach them how to relinquish the demands and expectations they're pulling on people in the world around them and start receiving their needs met righteously. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches. Oh, but they're in glory. They're in the gold. They're in the character. They're in the divine nature. Without the divine nature, uh, all you have is some kind of imitation of Christianity. But see, I'm not preaching something that I don't have the answers for. The question is, what we run into are the people who don't want the answers. They're happy with the substitutes. And substitutes can look really good. They can be sports, hobby. It can be um, education. It can, are there things wrong with that? No. But if it's a substitute for God, yeah, it's idolatry. Plain and simple. So the needy people, they live in the fear of man. As a, as a root issue. So there's the spiritual, the carnal, the one you could call codependent or overly needy, but they're not going to God to meet that need. What are they doing? They're looking for people, places, and things to meet that need. Matter of fact, uh, um, uh, our, the book we wrote, Soul Ties, is not just toxic relationships. Soul Ties can be a person, place, or a thing. Because soul ties are idolatrous. It's whatever you cling to more than God. Just look at, look at your finances. What, what do you spend most of your money on? You or God? Is it the things of God or the advancement of the kingdom or is it you? Think about it. God's looking for cheerful givers. Unhappy people are not cheerful. Carnal Christians are not happy people. The fourth element, and that's what this message is all about, and this is what our calling was. I was called to this as a baby Christian, and I'm not going to stop now. <laughs> and Jennifer improved much of it by documenting some of the consistent ways that the Holy Spirit would work in an individual's life. But uh, disciplers, full stature, what does that mean? It means that... Uh, you're not only returning to the gold standard, but the, you're talking Christian maturity, who by reason of use, you relate spirit to spirit. As a matter of fact, one of the ways you can tell you're mature, well, there's two, two tests that are simple. One is you can't be more mature than your emotions allow. You can't say I'm spiritually mature, but I'm an emotional basket case. No, 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 no. That means the emotions are not under the lordship of Jesus, whose supernatural peace dictates lordship. You might be saved, but he's not necessarily Lord. Now, God says in a discipler, and that's what this church is called to be. And if you're just uh, kind of put your Sunday face on and that's all it is to you, uh, you won't understand any of this. Because this is receiving the gold of the divine nature. You were given precious promises, the scripture says, so that you might be a partaker of the divine nature. The promises are there for you to partake of the gold. Uh, is there gold in that temple there or not? How much is in there that's real? How much of that would be sifted out would be considered real gold, real divine nature, real intimacy with God. Now, 
we were taught that we could be partakers. So I'm going to give you, yeah, something so simple. This will be like the first two years of my Christian life being duplicated over and over again until you live it, act on it, and disciple other people to enter into it. In other words, get your needs met righteously, because you can get your needs met in the flesh, and you can find all kinds of legitimate ways to meet those needs. But what it's saying is there's a hole on the inside of you that only the divine nature can fill, but you found other things to fill it with. My people, Jeremiah says, have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain, or the source, and they found substitutes. So nobody's really void. You've got substitutes in your life. There's no such thing as empty. You're filling it with something, and it's either the craving that'll never be satisfied. Jennifer said, even in psychology, right, gambling is the worst addiction ever because it teases you. Maybe next time I'll hit it. Maybe next time I'll get the lottery. So even if you lose and you lose everything through gambling, there's still that, that inner, but maybe one more time, one more time, then maybe then I'll get it. That is the addiction that never satisfies. As a matter of fact, you know when they died in the wilderness, you know what they named the place? The Graves of Craving. That's when the food was coming out of their nostrils. Not, not, not good before lunch, but uh, <laughs> really. They craved something, and God says, all right, you've got it. Look what you did with it. All right? So what I want to get into, and God really laid this on my heart, that he says we're going to go back to the gold standard. You're going to preach the gold standard, and I don't preach anything I haven't lived. <clears throat> it's not pie in the sky. This is doable. And it's doable for whosoever will. Now, will everybody? No. No. <laughs> Receive the gold of the divine nature. And it starts, obviously, with a relationship with Jesus. And for those that are mental and not relational, uh, this will mean nothing to you because you've chosen the way you want to go. You want to go the way of self, self-rule. What's things that I can understand, things that I can cope with, things that I can control. Uh, yes, Lucifer did that one. Didn't work out well. I shall do this. I can figure it out. I will ascend above the stars. I will be... Uh, and then, guess who had the last word? God. Guess what he said? You shall be brought down. As Je Jason taught in the last three episodes, every Christian should read... Uh, go on YouTube and watch those last three because you're going down the rabbit hole. So uh, I don't know who you are out there, but this is uh, thus saith the Lord from me. You're, it's time to come out. Come out. There's a way home. And God is giving a trumpet, a clarion call, a prophetic call to get back to the gold. Get back to allowing the gold to be pulled out of you. It's not doing any good under 50 layers of dirt, <laughs> of self-effort and self control and self-escape <laughs> and by the way dr phil had a good point he used to say and so how is that self-rule working for you because in my experience 40 some years in ministry 48 minute years in ministry i've never seen them as happy people and they've but they've got some person place or thing to blame it's their fault no responsibility for their own life just the blame game. Anybody can do that. That's flesh. Now, to receive, what I want to talk about is how to receive the gold of that divine nature. How to receive that reality. And it starts with relationship. And intimacy, here's a little formula for you. I don't like formulas, but I like what Jennifer did is she documented how the Holy Spirit works on a consistent basis. All of our books come out of not head knowledge. They all came out of how the Holy Spirit consistently works. Or like that fellow said from California, here's a couple telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. An honest Christian will admit, yes. you, know what's, you know what you're supposed to do, and you also know when you don't do it. <laughs> it's not rocket science. 
but are you getting the need met? If you're not doing the will of God, it's because there's a need that's unmet in your life. Learn, get discipled, and learn how to get those unmet needs dealt with righteously instead of God. Look, I had, I had a father that, re, that, that was rejected his whole life by my grandfather. I mean, he was rejected because he was, he was illegitimate. And my grandfather couldn't stand looking at my father's face. So his idolatry was to make him invisible. My dad said, I went to night school. My dad was constantly spending his entire life trying to get his attention. What a waste of time. You can't get that man's attention. He doesn't have it to give. He's already locked into his own way of thinking, his own value system. My dad would go, but I went to night school and I graduated. I got my degree at night school. I don't, oh, your sister made a salad yesterday that was just so wonderful. You cannot be acknowledged, but there is a legitimate need for that acknowledgement, isn't it? We're made that way. I don't care who you are. You say, I don't need people. I don't need that. Yes, you do. You need that, but you need it met righteously. Otherwise, you'll meet it with some substitute. What's your substitute? What's your unmet need? What did you wish you got and never got? That need, I, I would love to get teenage, teenagers at that age bracket because they could be disciples so easily to get their heads screwed on right early instead of learning the hard way and spending years uh, difficult. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make it available. Hey, teenagers that are serious about going after God, I'll make I'll make a special group meeting for you, and 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 mentor you myself, because what you learn in the first two years of mentoring, if it's going for the gold, going for the gold that's in you, it will affect. You see, there's a hierarchy of need. You need to start to trust somewhere, and you will never know the love of God until you trust. <laughs> so you're stuck. Until you trust yourself in, in somebody's care to be discipled, you'll never know the love of God. You'll never know the love of God unless you open your heart and trust them to come in, right? And then the third element is your value. That's what I want to get to. Because I've seen so many people that they, they got saved, they even had glorious testimonies of salvation, and then they remain pretty much unchanged for the rest of their life. Have you known anybody like that? Maybe you're like that. That doesn't have to stay like that. To remain basically unchanged after a salvation experience, that glorious transition of tapping into the divine nature, you've got gold in there, but you've never really trusted enough for the love of God to be developed in you. Jesus loved those disciples. He saw the dirt. Give me a break. He turned to tell me, you don't know what spirit you're of <laughs> sometimes. Oh, ye of little faith. He saw the dirt, but he saw the gold, and he was going for the gold. And it proved that the power of the Holy Spirit that came into their lives, the gold manifested. And that's what God calls discipleship. That's what God wants manifested in your life. And you can't give something you don't have. And you can't get something you're not open to. So God's saying, look, uh, the, th the, the, the so-called formula would be intimacy with God. I mean spirit to spirit plus commitment. Oh, commitment. That means how many Christians have absolutely no skin in the game? Think about it. No skin in the game. Cowards. Really. You want the name, tag, but no commitment in any way, shape, or form. That intimacy plus commitment is growth. So then, by and large, there's no growth. You can't skip. The, you can't skip steps. It's like you've got to start somewhere with trust, or you'll never know the love of God. After and unless you know the love of God, you'll never see your your value. How much gold God sees you as. It's not theory. He wants you to uncover the reality of your identity of how precious you are then you begin to function the way you were intended. You are all predestined to function. doesn't mean you are. But you are all predestined by God to function. And then you enter into purpose and destiny. And guess what part of the brain gets that? The satisfaction part of the brain. And all of a sudden it's like, ah, I found my niche. 
Yeah. And I'd rather stay here than do anything else in the world. I found that niche many years ago. And quite frankly, I'd be considered a happy person for all my years. But I know an awful lot of unhappy people that I'd like to see them get happy, blessed, happy. That word happy, blessed in the Bible is makarios in the Greek. A life joy that is enviable. You know, people were being fed to the lions and heathens said they got something. Now, they certainly didn't envy their position of being eaten by lions, but they envied that they had something. And it's like, I dealt with unsaved people that go, it's like you people know something that we don't know. And I said, what exactly is who? <laughs> it's who we know that you don't know. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, um, I figured it out in my head. I'm an atheist. Uh, well, that's not even an intelligent remark because an intelligent remark is, would at least know what, you've, what you're rejecting. Why don't you, you want to be a good atheist? Then by golly, accept Jesus into your heart and say, if you are who you say you are, come into my heart and show me and make yourself real to me. Then accept or reject him based on experience. People without experience are know-it-alls, the armchair expert. Just go on Facebook. I've got, I can only take it so long because the theology gets kind of, kind of weird at times. But anyway, but that's what's out there. You know why? Because we're not discipling. Go into all the world and make converts. No. Go into all the world and make disciples. Take some personal responsibility to make yourself available that if you've received a reality in God, then you got something to give. you got gold. But you can't give gold if you don't have it. You can't give it in theory. You're going to have to give it out of the reality of your own life. you got to live it, not know it. Now, if relationship is the key ingredient, intimacy plus commitment equals growth, when self rules... Uh, self is all locked up. You don't know how to belong. Belonging is locked up in a self-ruled person. Significance, which is what we're trying to get you to see, the gold. Significance is lacking because self is the center of its own little universe. It all revolves around you. Security is lacking because self is threatened by all external circumstances. Even church could be a threat because it might imply that you need work. <laughs> I wouldn't go to that church. I want them to just tell me that I'm, 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 I'm good and I'm, I, I need Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Rogers likes you just the way you are. Well, God actually expects you. He loves you the way you are, but he expects you to change and become more like him. <laughs> No Mr. Rogers Church here. No, uh, sorry. But this spirit rule versus self rule, when spirit is ruling and when the peace of God rules and when you just develop that intimate, even at a superficial level, d develop that intimate relationship with you, your self is liberated. Your spirit starts ruling. You start walking in peace. Self belongs, it's significant, and it's secure. That, that, those are good things. The, the three principles of relationship, all relationship with God and with one another, the mission of God is for relationship, of course, but it either releases life or death. Your relationship either releases life or death. What your relationships release emanate. Because you can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your body language and gestures, but you can't hide what emanates from your life. So, God is saying, we relate to God the same way we relate to people, we relate to people the same way we relate to God. There's an acid test for you to value, evaluate your Christianity. You rate Relate, don't say you relate to God really good. It's just people you don't relate to. Or I relate to people real good, it's just not God. No, 
You relate to people the way you relate to God. You relate to God the way to people. So evaluate your life. To what degree are you walking in any kind of honor or respect? Are you functioning out of that place of value? Now, go make disciples. You know, we were created in the image of God according to and told to multiply. We reproduce according to kind. What? Uh, if you just stopped your Christianity right where you're at right now and you were to reproduce like spiritual children or natural children, what kind of an example are you setting for your natural children? Because whatever is lacking in your example, they will take further. I don't care if it's giving, church attendance. I don't care if it's how you treat your neighbor, your discipline at home. Whatever you compromise, they will take further. Are you going to do that to your children? Would you do that to your children? Well, some of you do. That's the truth. You can't fake the example. Someone who says, Johnny, don't ever lie. Salesman comes to the door. Tell him I'm not home. You can tell them the right answers, but their spirit picks up. You're a liar. It's okay to lie because mommy lies. Daddy lies. It's okay. That's the example they set for me. Well, I'm just telling you there's another choice. You see the example my dad had with my grandfather? He was a broken, wounded, rejected man most of his life. I get saved, and God showed me my dad rejected me the same way, and we shared this two weeks in a row now, but it wants to be somebody who needs to hear that that's not listening. <laughs> but when my sister was on her deathbed because she had spinal meningitis, my dad looked over at, at motion toward me and said, why couldn't it have been him instead of her? So don't tell me about, you don't know what I've been through. I've had rejection. <laughs> You're a sissy. <laughs> Jesus says, i got a solution for that. It's called acceptance. And I release forgiveness to my dad for his example. Released him from any demand or expectation to ever give me acceptance or attention. I was invisible just like he was invisible. His father. He couldn't give it to me anyway. He never got it. He didn't know what we were talking about. Plus, it was a generational sin that just got passed down. Watch the generational sin and see if you're not doing worse than your parents did if that was passed down. Something to look at. And I released demands and expectations and the supernatural power of God as a baby Christian, and I don't regret one minute of it. I release forgiveness and I release any demand or expectation that he would ever give me attention. God supernaturally met that need righteously to this day. I am accepted in the beloved. God says, you're an apple of my eye. My thoughts are continually towards you, Dennis. The more numerous than the grains of the sand and sea, you're precious in my sight. There's only one of, one of you, Dennis, and there never will be another you. And I love you with a special love that can only love an individual that's a one of a kind. And you are that one of a kind. I am loved. See, my thoughts toward you are more numerous than the grains of the sand. See, see, that's real for 48 years. That's real. Would you rather have that or would you just rather be bitter and say, well, I'm a mess because my dad was like, this is the way my dad was. That's why I'm so goofy. Yeah, yeah, the blame game. That's the coward's way out. If you've got the tools and God wants to give you the tools to meet those needs, you're responsible to get those needs met. I don't know when I'm going to go be with Jesus. I'm not a young chicken. huh? But I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to disciple till it drives me loving, even more loving, because I see the need, hurting people covered in dirt, but there's gold in there. But you've got to allow somebody to let that gold out and quit thinking you know all the answers. I don't need anybody. You know, we teach in this church how to deal with stuff yourself. 
But when I hear someone say, I don't need it because I deal with it myself, I also say, but that's not totally balanced scripturally. Scripturally says, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. You know what? There's stuff in your life, I don't care who you are, that you can't do by yourself. God purposely won't let you do it by yourself because if you can't connect to the body, you're indicating a serious dilemma in your own heart and life. There's going to be a time when you're going to need somebody besides you. That doesn't mean you become needy. We talked about that in the beginning. That doesn't mean you're a clingy. It just simply means there's going to be some things that you're going to hit in life that, guess what, you're by yourself you're not going to be able to do no matter how well trained and equipped you are. Because God says, you know, true relationship is spirit to spirit. And there are multitudes and multitudes of born-again Christians who can't connect with a body. And guess what? You are not the church. You are not the church if you can't connect with a body. Life is spirit to spirit connection. Now we've got people that are living in a little small town in Oklahoma and Kansas, and we're their body. They tithe here, and they are here, and we know them, and they communicate. So there's really no excuse for, well, you don't know where I live, out in the desert. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard that back in the Jesus days when the, I'm a surfboard Christian. You know, I find God, me and God on my surfboard. Yeah, yeah, I know how that is. What that means is you're, you're relationally dysfunctional and you haven't dealt with it. But God wants it because there's gold in there that needs to come to the surface. I'll bet you I don't get any Christmas presents this year. <laughs> <laughs> but what are you going to do? Really, the gold, the, the things that God looked Look at Jesus. The, what I'm talking about character and that divine nature, that gold that's in you. Jesus walked for 30 years without doing miracles, without using his gifting, that some people take their whole security in their gifting. 30 years before he did his miraculous three-year ministry. You know, that's a ratio of 10 to 1. He taught you that the humanity of Jesus was what was an example for everybody. He even told his disciples. They said, show us the Father. He goes, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's character. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for that kind of character. 10 to 1. God wants you to say, you will know them by their fruit. People aren't even teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. Why would you not teach on the fruit of the Spirit? Because your emotions have everything in them but the fruit of the Spirit. And you don't know what they are. You can teach it out of a book. You can put it on the Sunday school bulletin board. Oh, I am joy, peace, patience, kind of, I don't have none of them, but I know they're cool. <laughs> God gave you emotions for the fruit of the Spirit. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, those come from the devil and his kingdom. And it's not sin if you suddenly got frightened crossing a street and you almost get run over, but it's a sin if you stay frightened. I'm never going to cross the street again. I'm never going to, oh, uh, I just, I live like this all day long, low grade anxiety. Oh, mm -hmm. That's sinful. If you don't treat it as sin, you're never going to get healed of it. You're just, oh, they're just emotions. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. They're coming from the kingdom of fear. So you're saying, fear is just an emotion. So I live in fear. Oh, do something about it. You don't have to live there. But you've got to set some discipline in your life because intimacy requires commitment. No commitment, don't expect growth. Don't expect knowing the right answer is good enough. You will know them by the fruit. Okay, now, okay, wow, the next uh, 15 minutes, I gotta, I gotta cover how to receive the gold of the divine nature the way God taught me. And that's gonna cover the what, the how, the when, the who, the why, the where, the why. And if we cover all that, yeah, good luck. All right, but here's what it is. What I believe we're gonna have a church full of is mystics. 
oh yeah, I'm using that word that was hijacked by new age. I really don't care who hijacks words and uses them to their advantage. But Noah Webster, I trust him in his 1828 dictionary, a mystic by definition, a Christian who is pursuing deep spiritual experience with God. I'm going with that definition. I don't care who hijacked it. I'm a mystic. You need to be a mystic too. You need a real relationship, not religion. Not mental assent. And here, I'm going to give you the verse of scripture that God discipled me in that first year. Now, when I say he discipled me, he took one verse of scripture and then day by day, I would glean more and more out of it until it became mine. But it was one scripture, probably, I'm guessing, about uh, probably at least a six-month period. And that scripture was Isaiah 50, verse 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5. So it was like he started out with, well, what word? You know, I'm his sheep, his sheep hear his voice. What voice? What word? There's ink on the page, and then there's the spirit. The ink can kill, but the spirit gives life. Oh, I want, that's what word I want. And it says, Dennis, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, that you would know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. And this is the way he did it. And he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned, as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Now, it took six months to get that in me and the different aspects of it. But the first thing that he showed me was, before you speak, Dennis, you have nothing to say because I was a talker. Mm -hmm. Even as a baby Christian, we'd be in a little prayer group, and I had an opinion on everything. I was raising my hand. And then after I raised my hand, I realized I probably interrupted the speaker more than I helped him. And then I realized that in my gut it would go, and I go, I think God was saying that it's not what I said. It was the wrong season. Maybe I ought to just shut up and listen for a while. Because until you really have something to say, you have to have heard something. Not just commenting on what you already heard. That's what talkers will do sometimes. Comment on what they heard. But before you speak, Dennis, you've got to hear something. And the scripture that corroborated that Isaiah 54 for me was, sacrifice and offering you don't desire. You don't want a bunch of dead works. You don't want a bunch of religion. My, You have given me a capacity to hear and obey. So I don't want all your dead works, all your religious activity. I want you to hear and obey. And until you've heard something, you don't have anything to say. And until you've heard something, you don't really know what to obey uh, in, in its fullness anyway, at least for the moment. So he had to teach me that I had to obey what I, when I did hear, I had to obey. Well, I was hearing Isaiah 50 verse 4. So he was saying, I'm giving you the tongue of a disciple and you're going to learn how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. All right. He answered and said, it is written, Dennis, man is, cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was a real eye-opener because there's the overall logos of the word, but the rhema word is that word that's quickened to you from the scriptures. That's the one that he says, and that word will not return void, but it'll accomplish for what I send it for. So then that got my ear to say, open my ear. I want to hear the rhema word. I want to hear the now word. I want to hear the quickened word. I know what the Bible says. It's good to read total concept, but I want to know the bread. You know when it says, give us this day our daily bread, it might include food, but it, it's really meaning that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You need that daily portion of reality in the relationship more than you need food. As a matter of fact, it's contradictory because do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drive? What shall we wear? What shall we drink? All these things the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. So why in the Lord's prayer would he say, give us this day our daily bread? That's pretty low level. So if it includes daily food, fine. 
But primarily, that is not the significance of that. He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. That's the daily bread you need. Now, God's saying the rhema, the quickened word, that's, that's the one that produces the divine nature. That's the, the word that you hear and obey. Okay, uh, how do I do that? Well, first of all, we already discussed the daily bread part. The how. The how of the word is understanding authority because every word you hear in this little between these ears, spirit or flesh, has an authority behind it. My sheep hear my voice. We always use that illustration of the shepherd. I saw it on a video tube, and I tell you, that was the most fascinating thing. A shepherd called his sheep, you know, blah, 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 what he said. Every sheep's head lifted up and looked when he spoke. Another man came by and repeated the exact words, and the sheep ignored him. They know that there is an essence. There is a divine nature. There's substance. It's nature. If you want to understand authority, you have to understand nature first. They heard the nature behind the words, not the words. They heard the authority behind the words, not just the words. We got people that are biblically literate but have no authority behind that word because they haven't lived it. They just like to say it or teach it or whatever. But God's saying the how of that word is understanding that nature is first. Now look at this for preachers. Nature is first, then the word, and the word and the nature should match because Jesus is the word. The third one is conscience, but you know that's authority. You should let your conscience uh, guide you and direct you, but it's only as reliable as your value system. <laughs> and fourthly, Five-fold ministers. Five-fold ministers, I don't want them to be on the top. No, I'm on the bottom as far as an authority. The divine nature of God is the primary authority and his word, and the two go together. The divine nature plus his word is the total authority. Conscience, your conscience can excuse just about anything based on your value system. You know, in the, the Didache, when they, they taught Gentiles, the 12 apostles saw that the Gentiles were coming into the kingdom, but they had no Jewish background. They had no Ten Commandments. They had nothing. They would have to say things like, um, your value system. I know your conscience don't bother you if you have a baby girl and you leave it out in the cold and let it die because you wanted a boy. Your culture allowed that, so your conscience probably don't bother you, but it should it's contrary to the biblical law of God. It should, right? So that's the how is understanding the authority behind the word. So first, he had to teach me what does the word say that's quickened. Secondly, what's the authority behind that word? Third, the when. When? Morning by morning. Morning by morning. Show me some... Uh, commitment to your relationship. Show me some discipline. Show me that there is a secret place for you. Show me that that uh, that there's special time and all the time that you're walking out of that intimacy and that relationship. You don't have time. You're busy. Remember, he didn't leave you. You left him. Hmm. But you don't understand. I can't pray, and I'm not really into this because I was hurt in the church. I was one. Jesus was hurt by religious people. Get over it. Really, that's that's not a legitimate excuse. I got wounded by Christians. I got hurt in the church. <laughs> Can you see Jesus walking? Say, those Pharisees were mean to me. They don't have, oh, no, no, I ain't going no more. I ain't doing nothing now. Well, that'll show them. <laughs> so the how and the when yeah. I, I like the authority be, but once you get gold once you have that quickened word once you agree to that quickened word 
it's like you have to understand authority. There's three Greek words for authority, but I, I just I love the illustration to understand it. There's the authority when you get the gold and it's real and it's God speaking to you and you receive it, then you've got exousia. Exousia is like the policeman's badge. So you're walking up and you got the badge, you got authority, but it gets better than that. Dunamis. That's the gun, that Jennifer, she liked that gun. I got so many pictures of her with her guns. <laughs> she liked that gun. So you got exousia, I've got the badge, I've got the authority, but I've also got the gun, the dunamis. I can kick in the door with that too. It's legal because the dunamis belongs to God. So it's legal kicking in the door. And then kratos. After I kick in the door and evacuate all the bad guys, I sit down in the chair and I take the remote. That's Kratos. I am occupying now. I am ruling and reigning and occupying. Don't you want that? Because that's what God says. I want you to understand about the Word of God. It operates that way. If you will be discipled, if you will allow to have the ear to hear what the Spirit saying to you. You know, gold always is represented scripturally the divine nature, silver redemption. I like that scripture. A word fitly spoken, because remember he's saying, I'm going to teach you how to speak a word. I'm going to disciple you to speak a word in season to them that are weary. Who? Them that are weary, heavy laden, bogged down with religion and self. <laughs> a word fitly spoken in due season is like apples of gold in settings of silver. It's the divine nature with a redemptive quality to it. All right. Like an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to an ear that listens. Oh, well, all this reproving I'm doing here, it only works if you listen. <laughs> and obey. Oh, that too. <laughs> but a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. And that's what God was equipping me. I'm going to teach you the wisdom of application. Uh, you're not going to speak everything you know. You're going to speak as I initiate it. I don't pick topics to preach. It's got to be a reality of what God is speaking to me over the night. I only speak and preach out of my own experience. If I wasn't experiencing this, I wouldn't, I, I'd be too guilty to give it to you. If I didn't live here, I wouldn't tell you. Because that'd be hypocritical. Now, the when, the when of the word. Oh, okay, I can finish this, I think. Well, maybe. Morning by morning. Morning by morning. There's special time and all the time. There's spirit time and there's soul timing. The word that they heard did not profit them. Do you know that where that's at in the scripture in Hebrews 4 2? The word which was heard did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Was Jesus anointed? <laughs> but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. You know what faith is? Substance. And substance can be substantiated, but they chose not to listen. They have another value system. And according to that value system, that would make me uncomfortable. But God says morning by morning. If we would learn to speak when there's peace, if we would learn to speak when the peace of God is ruling, we would have the when down pretty good. Actually, you'd make good business decisions. If peace was ruling and you made a business decision, God would be involved in your business. But if you do it out of fear, I don't have any confidence that anybody operates out of fear. I told Jennifer, that internationally known prophet that we went to see when we were first married, <laughs> he prophesied, oh, we must have been married about three years, I guess. No. One year? Okay. We were married a year, but he was prophesying about uh, on the planet. Y2K is going to be worse than anybody knows, way worse than anybody knows. And I told Jennifer, I went, no. I said, there's fear on his prophetic word. I don't care if he's internationally known. They can operate out of fear too. 
once in a while. They can miss it, right? And she goes, well, my brother, the lawyer, <laughs> I have to throw that in. My brother, the lawyer, he believes it's going to be just like that prophetic word. And I go, well, I don't care. She goes, I said, you mean you, you would trust your brother over my discernment? And she goes, I've known my brother a lot longer than you. <laughs> she changed, but it took time. Right? You still have cans and cans of food from back then. Yeah. I said, no, we're not going to do that. And she goes, well, guess who won? No, we're not going to buy cans of food in the store. Guess who won? The princess. She gets whatever she wants. <laughs> And I finally understood the man is the head of the house. He's the head servant. <laughs> yeah, I'm the head. I love it when Jesus says, you know, in the world, they, the Gentiles, they take authority and dominate you. And they call themselves benefactors. <laughs> we're, we're controlling you for your own good because you're too stupid to do anything by yourself. And you need me. We need a nanny state to where you're just babied. And we do everything for you. But really, we're looking out for number one. And as soon as I'm in authority, I don't even know who you are. It's all about me then. But the funny thing is, is that <laughs> God's saying that that's funny because that's the way it is in the world. So who's greater, he that sits at the table or he that serves? And you would say, he says to his disciples, and you would say, he that sits at the table. Yet I am among you as he that serves. Did you notice that fivefold ministers are on the bottom of the authority level? Because they're supposed to be servants. They're supposed to be equippers. They're supposed to be taking you from one place to the next place and pouring in the gold in you, the gold out of you, and then causing you to be motivated to reproduce according to kind. And you will pr reproduce according to kind. All of you will reproduce according to kind. Depends what kind you are. God wanted you to multiply, but he wanted you to multiply in his image according to his likeness. That's a little different than just multiplying. Otherwise you make them just like you. Do, you, do, you, do your children think you're spiritual? Good question. Are you setting an example for them? Morning by morning? I uh, know I can't finish this, but it's all one verse. You take it and run with it. Isaiah 54, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple. That should be your challenge. And who's he giving it to? The weary. I'm calling forth the weary. I want the people that other people gave up on. I want the weary, but they have to be ripe. You know what I'm saying? Because you can't be, you can't receive something you're not open to. But if you're ripe and you're willing, I'm calling the weary because God gave me the tongue of a disciple to speak a word in season to who? To them that are weary. And what are, they, what are they weary from? Doing it their own way, thinking they had a better idea. But Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So why does he want to do this? He wants to give you rest and re refreshment. <laughs> rest and refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. There may be a need to repent. There may need to need to say, I've been doing it my way for a long time. I wonder how Frank Sinatra is doing. He did it his way. And regrets, he only had a few. But then again, too few to mention. Are you in that category? That's dangerous ground. <laughs> uh, where, where does God find us? And here's where he's going to find it. We call it the babe spirit. But he says, but there is something I'm looking for. A person simple, plain, reverently responsive, to what I say. He's, he's looking for a babe spirit. He's looking for humility. It's the place of humility where all of this is found. And when he finds that humility, 
It's going to be a babe spirit out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. He doesn't need, this is why we tested even what we teach here. Jennifer's had every form of counseling, secular and Christian. And all of it, apart from what we're teaching you, all of it would be too complicated for a child. Can you imagine handing your four-year-old and saying, here, uh, write out a case history so I can figure out uh, what your history's been like so we could, oh, I got four years. It was like my youngest son. It was all having a meltdown. He was five years old. Oh, yeah, you don't understand. It's been like this my whole life. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> your whole life. But what we needed is they're intuitive, they're trusting. I can train a newbie better than someone who's been church for 40 years. Yes. Oh my goodness. It's like re-education, deprogramming even. <laughs> so what's the way that this works? This is the last part. It's the way of surrender. If you listen to Jason's three messages, the way back home, <laughs> it's surrender. As a matter of fact, we went and did a, a missions trip in Paris, France, at that church, remember? The translator was having trouble with me, probably my Chicago accent, I don't know, my vocabulary. But how did you say the word? Abandonné. Abandonné. We get the word abandon. But when they couldn't figure out what I was saying, but when we said surrender, the power of God came down. People started weeping. Abandonné means, Abandonné means surrender. Is that right back there? She speaks French back there too. She needs to sharpen your French. So, Abandonné and the power of God came. And you know what? That is the way home. If you would just surrender, there's always a way home no matter how screwed up you are. I've dealt with everything. I've seen it all change and transform. I've seen what even the psychologists and mental health said was impossible. I saw progress with them if they could surrender to it. But not if you know better. It doesn't work. Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down so we can build and plant and pull the gold out. We're going to become Holy Ghost gold miners. Right? Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.